Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you to the attendees who will be participating in this in this talk and hopefully the debate. Well, Congo's been in the news recently largely because of the taking of the city of Goma in eastern Congo by the M23 rebellion and also because the uh, alleged war criminal Bosco Taganda has given himself up and is now in The Hague at the International Criminal Court. Well, what I'd like to do is to give some recent background to what politics in the Congo over the past few years has been, and this will help our participants have a firmer understanding of the challenges that donors and development agencies and the security sector reform people have to go through uh, as Congo goes uh, into the, um, the coming year. So I'd like to start first of all by saying you can see in the presentation here there's lots of flags on this picture and one of the things I like to start with is saying that in Congo the more flags you see seems to be disproportionate to the level of the state. More flags, less state. The first question that I'd like to start with is, uh, well, we're going to start by saying that Congo is on the move. So there's a lot of things happening there politically, culturally, socially, and the country is really, really going through a lot of significant change, politically mainly, security, environmentally, uh, and lots of new, um, new partners involved, China and India. So we have this context in Congo. It's, Congo's the very large country. It's the size of the United States east of the Mississippi or the size of Western Europe with a very, very diverse ecological, cultural, political background. But things are happening there. Congo is more than a rape statistic in the Kivus or the habitual gloom and doom. Congo is a failed state, but things are happening there. And these are the, some of the things that I would like to discuss with you now. So, one of the first and important questions that I'd like to address is, do elections matter? So elections were held at the end of 2011, and was, uh, took a whole year to go through the, through the results and to figure out really who's in charge and what's going on there. So I'd like to ask this question, do elections matter from a democracy and state building perspective? Here you can see a lot of photos of the, of the campaign just prior to the elections in late 2011. So certainly elections do matter because they're part of the democratic process. There was significant voter registration in polling. There was a lot of popular enthusiasm. Voting is a manifestation of national sovereignty. And so this is something that's also very important in a country that's often associated as being a failed state. Respect of international commitments unlike the elections in 2006 that were paid for essentially by the uh, Congo's foreign partners, the 2011 version was largely paid for by the Congolese themselves and so they were able to respect their, their commitments to carry out these elections. Electoral mobilization contributes to political awakening. And this is something that's very, very fundamental in Congo because we often perceive as local populations as being rather uninformed or disinformed or outside of the political realm because they don't believe in politics, they don't believe in the capacity of the state to help them, they're more worried about what the state can do to them. So electoral mobilization did, particip did help contribute to political awakening. And the elections also count because it was a confirmation of political maturity. There was a relative lack of violence. The overwhelming majority of uh, parliamentarians were renewed. Approximately 10% were uh, re-elected. So that means that the voters were very dissatisfied and considered elections as a way of changing politics. So that's, that's a very positive sign. And there's a very, very keen sense of scrutiny, watching the politicians, who's doing what. So people are really, really now involved in the political debate, and elections contributed to that. Now, 
on the opposite side we can say that no elections really didn't matter for much most importantly because the 2006 electoral cycle never came to completion there were presidential elections were held parliamentary elections were held but those very fundamental local level elections that the level where people really know the candidates and they they can expect some kind of political return on people that they know they can knock on someone's door at the local level that phase didn't take place and that's an overwhelming challenge for a country like Congo that's very very diverse and very large so the people in the villages don't really have access to their MPs so instead of having the local level elections which would have brought in uh, politicians much closer to the local populations that did not take place and so that was a constitutional breach because that was supposed to be part of the 2006 level process so we went into 2011 with an incomplete 2006 cycle the elections were very very chaotic and this is something that's been documented by the European monitoring uh, agency the Carter Foundation the conference of uh, Congolese bishops all views confirmed that elections were very very poorly organized that polling stations did not respect their mandates the results were were not transmitted in a reasonable way bulletins were lost so the elections were not a very very good sign of uh, success for the Congolese authorities who organized them there was also considerable pre-electoral manipulation most importantly the Constitution was amended from two rounds to one round and this is something that's a great advantage to the incumbent so President Kabila wanted to give himself as much ch uh, chance as possible and so uh, before the elections took place there was a constitutional amendment changing the electoral processes to his advantage the other uh, pre-electoral -manip pre manipulation took place with respect to the National Electoral Commission which was a body that was very very uh, carefully controlled by the executive this was supposed to be a national independent commission it was totally dominated by the powers in place and the executive there was another very serious breach of good governance that took place with respect to the sale of state ass assets and this was very well documented by a, a report produced by the British MP Eric Joyce who uh, was able to establish that approximately five million US dollars of state assets were sold at very cheap prices to friends of Kabila who would able who was able to re resell these state assets at market value to very dodgy companies and this is part of the pre-electoral manipulation because the funds that were, were derived from the sale of these state assets were used by President Kabila and his political friends to finance their electoral campaigns so this resulted in the loss of local and international credibility and it has put President Kabila and his government so for at least the first six months of last year we were in a situation of political stalemate where it's legitimate to ask at that time who's in control and even today we don't really know who was running the country because a few months ago Kabila's closest ally in Eminence Grise Augustin Katumbe Mwake died in a plane crash and this was the man that was really perceived as being the king maker and the puppet master since he died and since the elections there's been a lot of speculation about how the government is actually run and who controls it 
So again, Western partners in the early phases of the uh, 2012 uh, period, just after the elections, was wait and see. And there was a lot of hypocrisy on the part of Congo's Western partners because even though the U.S. and Europe said that they wanted to have free and fair elections in Congo, it was very apparent from the beginning that they didn't want Kabila's main rival, the veteran opposition leader Etienne Chesikedi, to become president. He's perceived as being very unpredictable and someone that would not be favorable to Western interests in uh, in Congo. So it was there was a lot of hypocrisy. So uh, Western partners went from a, an electoral result situation saying, as we don't really know who's who won the elections, let's just presume that Kabila did and maintain business as usual. That's the situation that we were in for much of last year. So a little bit of uh, background, going a little bit further back, state building and reform since 2001, there was a huge effort to rehabilitate Congo's security infrastructure, army and police, and much of that went through the United Nations peacekeeping force called MINUSCO, which was formerly the MONUC, and MONUSCO is the world's largest UN peacekeeping force. It's about 20,000 blue helmets, and it has a price tag of around $1.5 billion per year. So this is a rather, a rather significant amount of investment in the security sector, but when we can see that a few months ago, a handful of M23 rebels was able to take the city of Goma, which has a population of one million people, where we see the ongoing security and violence taking place in the Kivus today, we can really ask the question how well the state building and reform efforts in security have worked. And my assessment there is that they're not working well at all. So there's been a lot of investment in poverty alleviation and poverty reduction, but Congo remains today the lowest ranking human development indicator country according to the UN ranking. So very, very poor conditions there. Improved governance and rule of law, this has been a catastrophe. Econo economy and public finance, there's been some growth, but very little, very little development. But just to give an indication of what we're talking about in terms of macroeconomy here, the national budget of the DRC in 2013 is less than 8 billion US dollars. This is a very, very small amount of money given the size of the country, uh, 70 million people, its tremendous natural resources, its mineral resources, forest uh, resources. So again, where's that money going? What's happening? Who's managing the, the the Congolese economy? With a budget of eight billion U.S. dollars, you're not going to really be able to get much done. Uh, this also raises the question about how mu how heavily should Western donors be in the Congo? Because Congo has the money to main to take care of its own development agenda if it wanted to. The real problem here is not lack of money; it's lack of political will and lack of vision in order to carry out the development agenda. The physical rehabilitation of infrastructure is also something that international partners have been doing for uh, the past uh, decade, but again, just uniting or trying to start to unite this very vast and fragmented territory has proven very, very difficult. Roads do not connect the country. The type of infrastructure that China is working on is b road building and infrastructure development that will enable the export of natural resources. And so the types of the, the map of uh, the map of ins infrastructure that China is working on, it's extroverted, it's going outwards to, to enable to facilitate the export of natural resources. There's not an effort to rehabilitate and integrate the national territory. Investment security, 
Congo's place in the World Bank's doing business is also rock bottom. It's uh, along the lines of uh, Somalia and South Sudan and Afghanistan. Investment security is amongst the very, very most severe challenges in uh, Congo today because we're not going to have development without private sector work. And private sector is very reluctant to invest in Congo because of lack of investment security. This is something that Congolese authorities have to address very, very significantly in partnership with the OECD and other major donors. In 2006, a World Bank best scenario simulated that the levels of development that existed at the end of the Belgian colonial period in 1960 could only be attainable by the year 2030, but only if growth rates remained strong until then. So this report that came out in 2006 was before the financial crisis of 2008. And so we have to, we're looking at a much further date now before those 1960 development levels can be reached. So I think this is also a very, very telling uh, observation that Congo is still very, very far from meeting its humanitarian and development agenda. While Congo's international partners have devoted funding, human resources, and diplomatic positioning to bring about positive change and reform in Congo, there is very little tangible evidence of success. In terms of funding, we're talking approximately $20 billion in the past 10 years. This sounds like a lot, but when you compare to the amounts of funding that's going into Iran or Iraq today, or the amount of funding that the European Union put into ex-Yugoslavia in the early 1990s, it's not really that big of a price tag. One of the problems of the reform effort is human resources. There's a lot of people coming from, from the developed North that have excellent technical skills but really don't understand the country and so there's experts going in without cultural sensitivity or local knowledge being able to speak uh, Lingala, Swahili, Chuluba, let alone French so it's uh, the type of strategies that we've seen to bring about positive change in the reform process is very largely based on a template approach where People going in have may, may have good skills that have worked in one country, maybe some things that worked well in Liberia or tested in Congo, or things that worked well in, uh, in other countries may have worked, and so you just try to replicate those success stories, but it's not working very well. Diplomatic positioning, this is also something in, in the transition period between the late President Laurent Desiré Kabila, who was assassinated in 2001, and then the election of his son Joseph Kabila in 2006, there were a lot of heavy hitters at the, on the diplomatic level. You had Louis Michel, who was an important Belgian uh, uh, politician who became the European Commission Commissioner for Human Development. He was very active in bringing about political reform in Congo in the mid-2005 uh, period. William Lacey Swing, the U.S. ambassador, was very influential and very interested in getting things going. He later became the head of the Manouk. Ambassador Rene Neskins. So he had some really top diplomats that were interested and had Congo kept on the radar screen. But more recently, with problems in Iraq, Afghanistan, the Arab Spring, Congo has dropped off the radar screen of these key diplomatic uh, priorities. Slight reminder here, and that is that Congo is a very rich country, but Congolese are amongst the poorest of the world. And I'd, I'd like to argue that reform failure is a shared responsibility. The government has shown more interest in consolidating its own power base than in managing the reform and development agenda. 
decisions are made by the president's inner circle. The balance between government, parliament, and the judiciary is very ambiguous. We can also raise the question whether or not the international community really wants a strong and independent Congo. 52 years of dependency, underdevelopment, foreign manipulation, intervention, and controlled sovereignty has been the lot of this independent country for half of a century. So if there's really a will to allow Congo, to help Congo be strong and independent, something's not going well in the whole aided delivery system that's been taking place over the past five decades. Uh, I'm not necessarily advocating a conspiracy theory saying that certain Western powers or other actors want to keep Congo in a state of underdevelopment for, so they can manipulate them and extract resources and control what's going on. This was probably something that would have been more appropriate during the Cold War at the time of Mobutu. But I would really say that we're in a situation where it's powerlessness that has led to this situation. No one is really able to bring positive change and development to this country because there are so many overwhelming challenges. Engineering reform in reconstruction is handicapped by major issues such as the historic depth of the crisis. It can go back from the time when it was Congo was the personal property of King Leopold II, the Belgian colonial period, which was uh, very dubious in the sense that there was some development, children went to school and there was public health, but at the same time there was no elite formation and no training, no class formation. Then there was the Cold War and the creation of Mobutu. So this is very much part of the long trajectory of crisis in Congo, which means that we have these problems of leadership, poor resource management, lack of political institutions that are viable. This is part of the historic process. We also cannot underestimate the role of Rwanda in Congo's problems. The most recent avatar of this is the M23 rebellion that's clearly supported by, by Rwanda. And there was the resource wars and the extraction of the illegal exportation of Congo's mineral wealth through, uh, to Rwanda and Uganda and other countries. So this has also handicapped the country's efforts to uh, state building. The political and social environment in Congo is also very complex and very diverse. This is also a handicap to reconstruction, as is the country's size and diversity. There's been a lot of actors that say that the country is just simply too big and too diverse to be managed as a single country. Even though a lot of people say that Congo would probably be better off as a more decentralized or fragmented entity with greater power to local, ent local uh, political entities, territorial through decentralization, we can't underestimate the importance of the power of being Congolese. The Congolese people themselves are very, very attached to their identity. And so the question of balkanization, which is often heard of, especially with, in, with respect to the eastern provinces, is something that is politically anathema to the vast majority of the Congolese people who are very attached to their musicians, their beer, uh, their way of life. They're proud to be Congolese, even though they have a great deal of skepticism towards the state. They're proud and attached to their national identity. Getting back to the question of powerlessness, I'd also add that everything is priority, but it is conceptually difficult to know where to start and financially impossible to address all challenges at the same time. Many strategies, policies, programs, and plans make sense at the theoretical level, but implementation is what raises problems. 
There's also the problems of competition. There's competition between international partners. For example, what uh, World Bank thinks is the right road for recovery is not necessarily what the European Commission believes or what Belgium is trying to work on doesn't necessarily correspond to what USAID initiatives are. So there's competition on the first level between international partners. There's also competition between international partners and Congolese actors because many of the reform and development strategies are designed in Washington, Paris, Brussels, London without significant or adequate consultation of the Congolese partners. And so it's very difficult to implement a reform strategy or development plan unless people are really on board. And the idea of appropriation comes to, comes to the fore here. Then, of course, there's major competition between Congolese authorities themselves, whether, whether that be competition between the mining in the forestry ministry, or whether it be between the rich provinces and the poorer provinces, whether it be between, whether it be between different ethnic groups, because don't forget Congo is a country with, with approximately 350 different ethnic groups. And so this, there's a lot of competition amongst the different factors in Congo themselves. So this competition leads to a series of fragmented and frequently contradictory actions where there's an absence of coherence, there's absence of continuity, and there's an absence of a consensual master plan. And these three problems are the major things that should be realized, should be attained in any type of uh, logical project cycle management approach. You know, it doesn't make any sense for one project to do something and then to have another project that that uh, counterbalances that or the absence of continuity in the sense that projects may last for three or four or five years and then they're evaluated as a success and then when the western donor leaves that comes to an end and they're not followed up on and then the absence of a consensual master plan that means if you don't have everyone on board with with an image of what what should be the priorities and who should help define these priorities that's something that we're also confronted with now because going back to the earlier point is we don't really know who's in control it's, and that makes it very difficult to have a consensual master plan there are also a number of missing links in the development agenda and one of them is the lack of an adequate administration. It's very difficult to rebuild a state if you don't have uh, an honest, well-paid, well-trained civil service. And this is something that we do not have in Congo. C civil servants are poorly paid. And that, a, a good salary for a civil servant in Congo is less than a hundred dollars per month. That's very difficult to feed the family with that which means that there's a lack of professionalism, poor human resource management, privatization of the workplace is something that's commonplace in much of Central Africa where anyone that has a, a modicum of power is going to use that for his own private uh, patrimonial intentions. Inadequate office spaces, something that's another major challenge. You can see that here are some images of what it's like in an office. Where where are the computers? Where are the the archives, the documents, the paper chase? This office is very neat, neatly decorated, but it's pretty hard to maintain a, maintain a development agenda in an office like that. You don't want to be imbalanced here. You have some more modern offices, but again very chaotic lack of computer equipment people sitting around you don't really know what they're doing who's in control there it's not very clear a second important missing link is that of the involvement of a strong and independent civil society because the Congolese government is in a phase now where they're consolidating power they're capturing power whereas in order to share power, you have to be strong. And that means that civil society, which is gradually emerging and doing some good work, is mainly in, with respect to survival strategies. Here we have the picture of a very important 
civil society activist Floyd Bechibea, who was assassinated because in Congo you can grumble to a certain extent. Another missing link is that of the private sector. There's very, very little private investment and the official revenues come from the extractive industries, mainly mining and oil, telecommunications, and breweries. There's the slow emergence of a banking sector, and this is probably one of the few positive elements that we can see in the macroeconomic centers that more and more people have bank accounts. But there's, there remains the absence of a middle class and capital accumulation. Without a vibrant middle class, it's extremely difficult to have private sector investment. The population is very socially stratified. You have a handful of very well-to-do people, but the vast majority of the rural populations are very poor, and most of the urban population, which is about 35% of the country, is also extremely poor, living in ghetto conditions that are unacceptable in the 21st century. This may seem like a random photo here, a picture of tomato paste. Some, it's an example that I like to give because to me it's very telling. Congo has, uh, Congolese women use tomato paste in their cooking from the 1st of January to the 31st of December. Every day they use tomato paste in their preparations. Congo has the agricultural space, it has the rainfall, it has the sunshine, it even has tomatoes. But guess what? There's not a single factory that produces tomato paste in this country. That's just one example of the lack of investment, even though there's tremendous markets and opportunities. That's something that it's very striking. Now, of course, many donors can take issue with my my flow of argumentation here, saying that no, every this is all crazy because we have lots of success stories. We're getting a lot of work done. Things are really going ahead thanks to us. But my argument there about the success stories is that acting on behalf or replacing the state perpetuates dependency and weakens state building efforts. Replacing the state exonerates authorities from their responsibilities because here, if something's not going well, it's never the fault of the government. It's saying, no, public health is not moving along as planned. Well, that was the World Health Organization that was supposed to be moving ahead with that project. Uh, problems with primary education? No, it was the World Bank that was going to help recon reconceptualize how we should offer primary education. Natu uh, uh, protected area management? No, that's the American NGOs that are dealing with this. So, the uh, war acting on behalf of the state exonerates authorities from their responsibilities, and so it's never really their fault when things go wrong. And so this perpetuates regime entrenchment to the detriment of a democratic process. Now, some of the risks that we've encountered here are obviously donor fatigue because after spending so much money in Congo, as I said, 20 billion over, over the past 20 years or so, donors are starting to say, well, is it worth it? Are, is the money that we're spending making a difference? And increasingly, the response to that is it's not making much of a difference. So there's, either they're reducing budgets or they're not spending budgets that have been allocated. There's a lot of social frustration and we're confronted by a very serious ongoing security challenge, particularly in the East. So to go back to the, the early part of this presentation about do elections matter, I'd say here that we mustn't confuse organizing elections and getting people to vote with democracy because the electoral process hasn't really brought about a true spirit of democracy. A couple of questions that we can think about for the debate now would be what is the institutional future for ordinary Congolese? What are social perspectives for the youth? 
but just to, uh, going back to the issue of the security problems now, we know that the militias that are wreaking, wreaking havoc in, in the Kivus are comprised of young boys. They don't have family support. They haven't been to school. They don't have jobs. What's the logical solution for them? Is to take up to take up arms because they believe that with and they often say this with the gun I can eat, and so the problem of managing the youth in Congo is overwhelming. And if it's not addressed, there's going to be increasing flow towards the militias. So to say Congo's on the move, that's certainly the case, especially with the, lots of new investment on the part of the Chinese, on the part of India, South Africa, Brazil. There's huge investment going on, huge activities in the natural resource sectors, whether it be mining, forestry, agriculture. Congo has black gold too. Congo has tremendous hydroelectric power. So the, the, one of the main questions I'd like to ask here is to what extent does poor governance really matter? Because we've seen a lot of dynamism in the natural resource sector. And this is something that I think has to be tracked in the coming, in, in the coming years. So Congo's on the move. Where is it going? That's the question that I'd like to kind of uh, terminate to finish this presentation with. Prime Minister Matataponyo has tried to manage whatever uh, he can do in the government with very limited resources, with a fragmented government, with parallel government institutions run by the executive. What are some of the political scenarios? Three here. President Kabila remains in power. He controls parliament. He manipulates his international partners and carries on business as usual. That's pretty much the prediction that I made one year ago, and this is what we're seeing. The other thing that we're also seeing, and this is a bit more fortunate, is that Kabila is in power but he's under pressure by international partners and by the opposition forces and civil society that are gradually getting organized for the elections in 2016. And lots of Congolese opposition members and uh, politicians are saying, well, we have to be prepared for 2016. We were ill-prepared for 2011. We're not going to make that mistake again. Another political scenario is that Kabila is ousted either by coup or assassination, which would lead to Congo's further uh, erosion of sovereignty in a renewed period of neo-trusteeship. There have been efforts, there have been uh, indications that Kabila has been subject to a coup attempt. There was a coup uh, organized allegedly from Brazzaville uh, a little over 18 months ago and there have been a number of incidents where we're really wondering if uh, his, how well his backers are willing to maintain him in power. Congolese often say that l'impossible n'est pas Congolais. Impossible is not a word in the Congolese dictionary. This was a picture that I took just before the elections. Freshly painted building. Here, after the elections, you can see that the belief that impossible is not a Congolese word is starting to fade. The, the paint is chipping off that facade. And so it's no guarantee that people are going to maintain their positive attitudes. But I would try to add towards at the end of this presentation to try to think of some positive ways of looking at the future of Congo is that positive change will come from the people, largely from women's groups, not from the government or from external interventions. Reform initiatives cannot be efficient or sustainable without vibrant local institutions that people trust. And I think that the word trust is the most important word in the Congolese dictionary today because this is what is the most important objective that we have in bringing about trust between people in their government, government in their international partnerships, 
trust in the the reliability of investment strategic strategies and most importantly trust amongst the Congolese people themselves thank you very much thank you very much dr. Trifon. Uh, and while people our audience is uh, entering their questions in the chat box down below uh, I'd like to throw one in here uh, given as you say that change in the Congo is primarily from the people what external influences do you see as the the most effective and conversely the least effective well is the the message that I've tried to communicate here is that the the main reform effort that's taken place over the past uh, 11 12 years is probably not the best approach so I think that there's been inadequate investment at the very local level donors tend not to know how to invest at the local level amongst communities they prefer the big strategies they want to start from the top bottom-up development is something that's more complicated so that's one thing that I think we have to mention and the other thing is the whole question of is Western style aid delivery from uh, the emerging economies like China. China's getting things done throughout Africa. Africa, in Congo in particular, has the natural resources that the world needs. And so the, ho the whole discourse of good governance and bringing about democracy is something that the Congolese authorities are not very sensitive to. What they want is development. They want, they want access to new flows of capital that can only come from natural resource management and Western powers in their reform agenda haven't given that sufficient emphasis the Chinese and the Indians are doing so thank you sir and here's a question from uh, dr. Claire Mattel it's uh, uh, if aid dependency is an issue and the government takes advantage of much of this aid what do, what do you suggest the inter international community actually do well, the, I, w I would definitely suggest that that the international partners that have been providing aid to the DRC be much more selective about how they go about distributing it. I've just recently evaluated a DRC governance assessment prepared for by USAID and one of the main recommendations that I made about this governance assessment is that aid delivery as it's uh, dispersed by the US government is tends to create regime entrenchment it benefits the elites it does not benefit local populations so avoid avoid re uh, regime entrenchment through top-down approaches like budget support that's one of the things that's been big on the the international donor agenda is they don't really know how to go about uh, uh, dealing with local level development so they give money to the government but we know that the government is corrupt and that money's not going into the programs that it's designed for so that's one of the things that needs to be avoided and the other very very strong recommendation that I would make here and I thank you for this question Claire what we have to focus on is natural resource governance because positive change in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is intimately linked to the natural resource sectors and so if we can improve governance in things like transparency uh, making sure that illegal timber doesn't come into Europe or the US markets making sure that uh, oil companies are not uh, creating uh, disrupting protected area management uh, problems like in the Virungas so what are the, what are Western partners doing that uh, that could contribute to improve natural resource management I think this is probably one of the most important avenues that we should be pursuing in terms of development aid thank you very much and uh, another question from uh, Dr. Mattel what do you think the the US State Department needs to say about do they need to be more vocal about Congolese uh, government corruption <coughs> well the US government like the European Union governments are in a pretty difficult predicament because 
their voice doesn't count for much. They can come in with a, a discourse of corruption and good governance and they want to improve aid delivery systems. But number one, they're not put, these governments, our governments are not putting enough money in that can compete with the steamroller effect of the new partners like China. The traditional aid is not making that much of a difference. It hasn't made a difference in the past, and so I, I think we have to make a very clear distinction here that we know that aid is not efficient in Congo. Aid delivery is not working, but the reason why we're perpetuating this system is because we want to have a position around the negotiating table. It's important to be present. Because, as I say, Congo's moving very quickly. We don't know how things are going to go. And so we don't know what's the future of Chinese investments. We don't know whether or not the Indian model of trade and commerce, if this is going to make much of a difference. So it is important for Europe and the U.S. to remain a presence, to remain present in, in the aid delivery system. But they have to be very, very realistic about what the, uh, the real results will be. Improve natural resource management or local development, given that they have a vested interest. Uh, is there a way to accomplish your suggestions without undermining the government? Well, I don't think the two are necessarily incompatible, because one of the uh, one of the points that I did not s significantly emphasize here is the role of decentralization, because. The, one of the main problem about the main problems relating to natural resource governance is the fact that it's the Kinshasa government, the resources of the entire na uh, national economy, tend to stay in the hands of the Kinshasa political elite. Now, one of the things that's very very important is decentralizing not only natural resource governance but the fiscal dimensions of how these resources should be maintained, how that should be managed. For example, the, uh, the natural resources of Katanga, the mineral resources, end up in Kinshasa. So that means that that's creating development imbalances in, in Katanga. Uh, every single province has some form of natural wealth, whether it be oil, whether it be forestry, whether it be biofuels. And so if these resources could be maintained and man, uh, could be managed at the provincial level, this would be a way of uh, providing a strong negotiating position with the, uh, between the local governments and the Kinshasa government. And this would put, this would put things into a much better balance. Thank you. And, and on a, on a, to kind of dovetail on that decentralization thought, um, if top-down efforts appear to be terribly ineffective, what sort of uh, micro-development efforts have you seen that seem to be uh, getting a lot more traction than the, the top-down ones? Well, certainly work that is being carried out in improving agricultural techniques, public health, uh, primary education, support of you know, the, the small Belgian NGO that's supporting a school in a certain province, or uh, work that's done by certain religious groups. You know, we can't underestimate the, the, the power of religious groups and the power of, of the big churches uh, in Congo. And this is the type of work that, that does matter. You know, people sending in used clothing to, to communities. Uh, getting communities to be able to self-finance efforts, you know, uh, creating microcredit institutions. These are things that definitely work. But the big donors tend not, they tend to shy away from these things because in terms of project cycle management, it's just as easy to manage uh, a, a, a one billion a one million dollar project than a ten thousand dollar project. And so the, it's a paradox there. We know that the smaller projects are appropriated better and we have a greater impact, but they're much more difficult to work on from a, from a donor point of view. So, and I, I think that's all the questions we have right now. Do you have some uh, closing comments for us, Doctor? 
the only closing comment that I would make is that I have tremendous, tremendous confidence in the Congolese people. They're going to continue to be resilient and to be dynamic and to be powerful. And it's the people that will make a difference. They're going through a very bad patch now. They've gone through a very long period of crisis and conflict. But I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably certain that with new environmental management strategies, there will be increased levels of development and people will be able to derive a greater sense of, of benefit and at the same time that that will impact the way that the nature that the that power is run in Congo because that will give greater empowerment to communities through the natural resource base